Hi, I'm John Kachoyan, Literary Manager at Australian Plays. And we're talking today to the outgoing Artistic Director of the Sydney Festival, Wesley Enoch. Thanks for joining us, Wesley. So this is our third time talking, which is, um, it's a pleasure to have ongoing conversations with you like this. Now, I know you're always really careful never to suggest a theme or to kind of impose an idea on the festival uh, from your own point of view. So. I suppose I'm really curious this year, what have been the conversations that you've been having with artists? What are they wanting to discuss? And how, if anything, have those conversations shifted over the year as COVID hit? I think that there's been two kind of pathways that have been coming through from artists. One have been, uh, let's not forget climate change. Let's not forget what how important uh, our contribution to climate change is. And so there's been a number of works in Sydney Festival which talk to that. And then this interesting thing about memory and memorial. How do we remember um, people, objects, uh, moments in time? And I, I place it very clearly, the big three themes out of this year have been, yes, COVID, but through COVID, ideas of isolation, how um, isolated we have felt yet so connected as well through tech digital technologies and what we've been doing in that process of isolation has been reaching out and the arts have been the center point for all of that reaching out either through music or, or uh, live streaming of performance or any number of things that that the arts have or, or even finding your inner voice the arts have been central so i've been fascinated that in this theme of isolation that the arts have been about self-expression, community expression, ideas of coming together, even when we can't physically come together. That idea of climate change, the effect of COVID on the environment, watching when cars and aeroplanes and, you know, we don't need them as much, what that means for our environment. And, and as a little anecdote, I, throughout the pandemic lockdown in Sydney, I was watching the IBIS and the ibis turned from the bin chicken to this elegant white bird because there's nothing in the bins, no bin juice for them to drink. And so this idea that there's an ibis um, grazing in the parks and the green spaces of Sydney, turning into white birds. And then as soon as we start to come back into the streets, the ibis turn dark again and you go, oh. And then also, of course, with climate change, the idea of the... Um, the bushfires that, that occurred earlier in, in the year throughout, well, 19 and also into 20, and how that has affected our, um, our identity as well, who we are and what we need to change. And the idea to the other big theme being Black Lives Matter um, and this need to go, actually, there are some very, there are some fundamental issues around how we work with each other in our society and how do we build memorials or build collective memory so that we as a society don't slip back uh, and both the the covid induced economic crisis as well as you know the cultural crisis we're going through there's a real pressure that we slip back into you know what whatever precedent is what was successful before we now need to do. And you know, it wasn't successful before, it was just dominant before. Yeah. And so this idea of going, what do we put in place? What markers do we put in place to go? How do we remember this time? How do we remember perspectives that were maybe alternative perspectives? And how do we build memorials in art to make sure that we can move forward? Yeah, it's, it's a fascinating tension because theater, I mean, there, there's a tendency perhaps in certain types of theatres to be backwards looking or for forms or stories to, um, you know, certain, to be constrained by nostalgia. But there is a really important function in theatre too, which is to be a repository of, of memory and, um, and story. But memory is an interesting thing because th there, there comes a point too where, um, you know, when Shakespeare was writing in his day about historical figures, he was using that to highlight what was going on in his day. It wasn't like it was hermetically sealed in the past. In many ways, it was the way you could talk about the, the present or even the future by kind of trolling through the past, pulling up things that were interesting and, and maybe even contentious and putting them into a historical context so uh, people found it palatable. So we, need, we can do the same thing by talking about 
the past, we, we shine a new light on who we are today. And I think there's a, there's a number of works that do that as well by, by pulling the past up and reshaping it so that the present day has, uh, if you like, a, a, a potentially uncontentious or incontentious, uncontentious kind of view of what the big ideas are because we're seeing it through a historical lens. Yeah. I wonder if there's a version of this festival pre or post COVID, you know, are there, are there things that we, that didn't make it in or things that we gained because the world shifted so radically? I think that, well, my experience, because we've gone all Australian, we decided to go all Australian back in March and this notion of pushing that forward, not inconsistent with a lot of the values I've been expressing anyways, you know, but this notion of when put under pressure, when suddenly saying, okay, you've got limited resources or you can't work in this way or audiences won't accept you in that way. What comes forward is not so much what's the economic impact or, you know, how many bumps on seats. It starts to become about your expression of values. What do you value more? Um, And, you know, some people want to hold on to the international. Some people want to hold on to, you know, the large scale um, uh, heritage art forms. Not my thing. But this idea of going, oh, actually, uh, how do we commission more? So, so last festival, 2020's festival, it's weird when you say last one, but 2020's festival, um, we had 45 commissions and new works. In 2021, there's 39. So that hasn't slipped back. That's actually forward and moved forward in ways that... Um, and what's slipped back is some of the big international work and some of the blockbuster stuff that international sometimes brings you. And for me, I don't, I don't grieve for that. I don't grieve for what isn't in a festival. What I'm celebrating is that this moment in time is very much full of really amazing Australian works uh, and collaborations that you go, maybe wouldn't have been there if it wasn't for this particular moment and look anyway if you spend your whole life grieving for what you don't have you know you start to get it it chews you up inside so it's much better to celebrate and to go actually look at what we can do when we're grounded (laughs) you know when we're not allowed to leave you've got a lot of experience leading organizations in 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 different forms was there anything surprising about this job or or the city uh you know, knowing that it's somewhere that you have deep ties to and have made work in previously. But I suppose I'm just curious about that. I think Sydney has become a little less of the star fucker Mm. in this last little while, if I can swear. Sorry, sorry to swear. (laughs) But, you know, there's this whole thing that Sydney is, uh, can be anyway, not always, can be fixated on the confectious, you know, what's tasty at the moment and let's grab hold of it and consume it. And that things have slowed down and gone, actually, it's not about this kind of um, quick sugar hit. It's actually about something else. It's about a cultural conversation. I've been really fascinated. I mean, one of the things that we've been trying to do at the festival is to say, um, actually, here's a recovery narrative that we can form together. So, you know, um, uh, the ensemble, the um, uh, Sydney Dance Company, uh, Force Majeure, uh the australian brandenburg orchestra the symphony orchestra like actually going like large companies small companies independent companies or even individual artists going actually we can all be together to have this recovery narrative together it's not one part of our sector or the other it's all of us working together in that way yeah and i think i think one of the things i've noticed about your leadership is that you put your money where your mouth is um, to lean into the cliche, to actually sit down and, and make commissions and commit to making work rather than just talking about it. Has that always been part of your culture and practice to, to reach back down and help pull up as it, as it were? Well, oh, goodness gracious. Uh, look, I, I don't even see it in the way um, you've expressed it in many ways, you know, kind of pulling down to lift up is, is, there's a kind of differential. I still think I'm amongst it. You know, I love the idea that um, the employer of today is the employee of tomorrow. You know, that kind of idea that we, we, we live in a very fluid kind of artistic environment. Um, very easy to say. But once you have a decision-making position, your job is to be a representative for the, what I call the unelected cultural parliament. 
you know, you are representing a much bigger body of work, uh, a much bigger kind of politic, if you like, than just your own personal views. Um, so, you know, people have said, why didn't you just turn the Sydney Festival into an all Indigenous festival? You go, because it's, I'm actually a custodian of something that's more than just what I want it to be. And that actually makes things weaker. You know, when you just do one thing or one perspective, it makes it weaker. Whereas if you have a diversity of approaches, a diversity of voices, then it's like, um, like when, when we think about an, uh, an ecosystem of uh, uh, flora and fauna, you know, the more diversity you have in that ecosystem, the more robust it is. And in similar ways, you know, just talking recently about opera and this notion of is opera about to fall over because of its economic modeling and its audience base and all that stuff. And you go, maybe, maybe, maybe not. But what we're talking about is how it has narrowed its audience, how it has narrowed its practice and has been caught in its historical frame. So it hasn't evolved as quickly or as much as it could. And therefore it's weakened its position. Whereas in fact, if there is diversity in the way those voices occurred, perhaps it would be in a stronger position now. And theater has been a really good example of this where uh, the diversity of voices, the, the currency we have in finding new voices, you know, there is absolutely a, a kind of almost cash currency in finding a new voice and supporting it, uh, supporting it through mid-career into senior, maybe not, but finding new voices has been uh, something that artistic directors find uh, empowering. And that's been great because I think that it means that we find new audiences and we build audiences over time. Mm. You and I talked last time about there being generations or a spectrum of indigenous work that the conversations move uh, on or forward. What has been the shift in the Indigenous work that you've been able to present in the festival? And um, can you speak to that? Oh, I think uh, there's been diversity, which I think I've talked about as well, already diversity of voices. But I think that there's something about scale that I can, can talk to here that's changed. The Sydney Festival, well, while I've been here at least, um, has been instrumental in seeding and supporting large-scale commissions that have then gone on and, and toured through different festivals. I mean, just m most recently, Black Ties was like that. That was a big, large-scale commission, um, The Season by Nathan Maynard. And we've got a new work of his, um, Hide the Dog, coming up, where we go, okay, his first play ever was The Season, and off it went on this big tour and, and really got a lot of support and backing. And you go, okay, what's the next thing? And the next thing, and the next thing. And to keep working an artist or, or an artist to keep working in scale is fascinating because it also builds an audience for that, for that work. Hide the Dog's a beautiful piece. And it's in fact a, a collaboration with James, Jamie McCaskill, who's a, um, a Maori writer. And it's about an Aboriginal child and a Maori child getting together um, and they're gonna hide the dog and the dog is a thylacine, a, a Tasmanian tiger. And they build this canoe, which is a hybrid of both their techniques and styles. And then they go to visit the spirits and gods of both their cultures to talk about what they need to do. And it, it was interesting because I didn't see it as an environmental story. I saw it as a cultural story, but then to realize they were actually talking for guidance about extinction. And I kind of went, oh. And then, so these themes keep arising out of what are very beautiful stories. And this is a big work for, for Nathan again, big visual work, um, a beautiful, and he said, uh, I said, why did you wanna do a family work? I mean, what's that about? He said, oh, I need to do something for my kids. And so suddenly you go, oh, kids, extinction, a sense of the future, uh, a, a cultural kind of connection. You go, oh, that's powerful, really powerful. And so for me, uh, just going back to this idea of, works of scale for Indigenous performers or extending the life of work. Um, the Weekend was another really great work from Mughalan, which uh, though COVID kind of curtailed its tour, is going to get up and go. And, it's, you know, it's a one-person show, show, not scale, but the scale is then represented in the scale of touring it can do and how it can reach more and more people. Yeah, absolutely. There's been a lot of conversation about 
in the arts community about what we want our work to be, what we want our work to look like and who are we making it for and what should we be doing in a world that's changed. And I suppose my experience of COVID this year has been that it really didn't create any issues, that it really just illuminated the challenges we already face a lot more starkly. And whatever cracks that were already there became chasms. Yeah. So the digital divide, the cultural divide, the, the divide between the rich and the poor, um, the, the divide between those who have access to the halls of power and decision making and those who don't. Uh, it was a whole range of things. It was interesting to watch the arts kind of be shifted to the side very, very easily. Like there was hardly any kind of um, any whimper. We were the, the first to close down, especially in theatre. We were the first to close down and we're amongst the last to get back up again to full speed. You know, if you're a shop or a restaurant, you were getting a lot more support earlier than you were if you're a theatre company. And so that's interesting. And I think too that artists have um, not, they find, oh, well, actually, I think there's a couple of pathways here. The, the celebratory, the one which says, let's celebrate this. Let's find ways of celebrating who we are in this environment. And then others who have gone, I'm so scared. I just need to keep talking about who, who I am and who I want to be. Um, that it was almost ex excluding of others. And I think good artistic leaders are actually jumping on the, um, the celebration of diversity a lot more. I mean, uh, um, Queen Fatima or Fatima. Uh, uh, Fatima? Do you say Fatima or Fatima? I think Fatima, yeah. Yes, yeah, so I've heard, I've heard that the, the company say both, mostly because there's also this whole, whole idea they want to play with the word fat. Um, so uh, uh, Queen Fatima or Queen Fatima, um, which is about uh, um, uh, Miss Lebanon, Australia, and Lebanese, uh, Lebanese Australian beauty queen pageants. And you go, what? And how that connect into communities and all that stuff. And, uh, and, and James Ellesey, who I think is a fabulous writer who gave us Lady Tabuli at the last festival. Again, backing it up, let's back it up. Let's get a new interesting artist in there to, um, and, and back them up with their next production and their next production. And that will be a fun, fun work with National Theatre of Parramatta that we've been working on. Um, and that's a new commission. In fact, we were going down a different path with a different work and it stalled for whatever reason. And then this work just came out of the blue, like, you know, like, the, the, like it was sitting in the back of the pack and it, it put itself forward and said, yep, I want this to be the case and up a chop. It was fantastic. Uh, and I should say too that in the same way, um, Dori Dari has come from uh, PYT Fairfield, beautiful community-based um, uh, uh, theatre-making um, company, or more than theatre, I guess, but art-making company. Um, this work, Dori Dari, which looks at the history of Persian poetry, uh, especially love poetry. And it was interesting when I went to one of the workshops, uh, the showings of it, this idea of the long, long, long history of poetry in Persian society to, yes, express love, but also to give advice to each other, you know, to go back to the, the writings of, say, Rumi and pull, pull up something and the ability to quote poetry to each other, um, the, even the, how that's manifesting in uh, phone apps, you know, where you can kind of um, get, a, on, get a bit of poetry on your phone that is, is how you're seeing the world at the moment. Uh, in many ways, how Christians may look at um, scripture for guidance on an emotional or spiritual level, that the poets play a much stronger role in Persian society. And I say Persian, you know, in that very broad sense, yeah. um, and how that kind of plays out. And Dori Dari is uh, basically an unwrapping of this beautiful storytelling uh, about Persian poetry. That's fantastic. One of the interesting things that we've talked about is the fact that there are many Sydneys, you know, that the city is a, a vast and sprawling beast uh, and that your work at the festival has deepened connections to the west of Sydney, especially. But are there any other emerging Sydneys that, that you've discovered or that you can observe happening that have kind of come out of this um, otherwise kind of binary idea? <laughs> well, we, it, it's interesting to, to now in Sydney, the conversation is not about Sydney and the West, but in fact saying that there's the Eastern city 
the central city and the western city mm-hmm. uh, and the central city being Parramatta and the eastern city being the CBD of Sydney um, because the way the population works is very very different now um, and that the geographic centre of, of Sydney is further west than you'd even imagine um, but you know because you know for, for whatever reason the CBD in Sydney is there but then behind each of the almost propagandist images of each of those three cities you know there's the kind of uh, what do they call it now um the the city the aerotropolis the aerotropolis is the city around the new airport that's forming in western sydney and you go what the aerotropolis it's not even built yet but it's already getting this kind of idea of high tech and whereas often i think we have thought of the more west you are in almost any city in in the country except maybe perth the further west you are the more bogan you are you know a westie and all those kind of derogatory terms which is not true but that's that that comes from a very old english world where um i I don't know if you know this but um those with power and wealth would always situate themselves in the east of the cbd so that the sun was always at their back when they were going to work or away from work. So you live in the east so that when you're going to work, there's no sun in your eyes. And then when you're leaving work, the sun is at your back, you know, from the west. So this whole weird kind of, you know, bloody European shit. I mean, doesn't mean <laughs> real. Anyway, I'm saying that because there are always these other narratives that are forming. Um, one of the works that we, we, we're working with Johnny Hawkins on a, on a play called Maureen, which is so beautiful. And it's um, King's Cross at the moment through the lockout laws and, you know, a whole range of um, social disruption that's happened there as well. It's lost a lot of its kind of sense of character. And, and Maureen, um, uh, Johnny was a, a good friend with this uh, woman called Maureen who uh, I think about four years ago, I think she passed away, I think it was four years. Um, And she was uh, like a costume designer, fashion kind of sewer uh, who lived in King's Cross and this cranky old, wonderful kind of character. And Johnny has brought this homage to this beautiful woman and her soul and brought that to stage and he embodies her on stage. Um, And it's a celebration, if you like, of one of those stories that always sits underneath the official narrative of a place, you know, this, this heavy chain smoking, well not chain smoking, a heavy smoking character who you, who understands the world from that perspective. We often think of older people as um, what's the right word? Conservative, mm. uh, stuck in the mud, kind of non adventurous. Mm. But in fact, there are some older people out there who were children of the flower power movement and, really you know they they understood the drugs and the sex and the rock and roll unlike you know yeah. almost like we see now and <laughs> and this this beautiful kind of work uh, maureen this little chamber piece that um we're, we're going to be doing as well that's some of the un, you know those stories that just sit underneath everything as well uh, and well a bit unrelated to theater but this whole conversation about lockout laws is interesting because um, part of the narrative is you can't go out. COVID has reinforced that and said you can't go out. And so we're doing a program called Allowed and Local, which is saying go out to the bars, pubs and clubs, and we're putting on live music, over 50 gigs throughout the city to help celebrate that. And so there's there's narratives that exist in a city. And then there are, you know, the the, the dominant narrative of Sydney is that it's a hedonistic party city that's not been the case. And we've had counter narratives and layers of counter narrative to that. And so we go, what's, what's actually a reasonable place? Where do we need to go? And it's something like the Sydney festival or, or pieces of art can help kind of illuminate that a little bit more. So lastly, I'm really, I'm really curious this year, the digital has been so present both out of necessity and out of celebration, as you said, I'm interested to see what you think might remain of that digital interaction and what's what have you observed about that phenomenon and I suppose for me it might also it might almost be now that there's an obligation to ensure some digital way of sharing anything we make that it's 
about radical accessibility. I'm curious if there's a, a tension for you between the digital and the live, and what, if any, of this uh, digital innovation will survive, do you think? We shouldn't, we shouldn't think of these two things, the digital and the live, being antithetical. Mm. And often we think about that only because we have limited resources. We think we can only afford to do one or the other. Um, and I think that, as you're saying, what we're saying now is that there are very cheap ways of picking up your phone and sharing things in a digital way or, or doing Zoom calls and conversations, which are just as informative and maybe it doesn't have to be high tech to do it. Uh, what I've loved about the digital is this idea of um, removing barriers to access. So geography has been one. So suddenly we're, we're looking across the nation and across uh, the, the world, really. The idea of also time that you can now be seeing things sometimes on demand whenever you want, or you can be sitting down at a time that suits you to watch certain things. Um, I was just thinking about Hamilton when everyone watched it, when at different times during the day, it wasn't a kind of joint experience, though the conversation was still a joint experience in that way. Um, the idea too of mobility, this if you were um, caught, uh, um, that, that you can't leave your home because you're, uh, uh, you're vulnerable because of your immune system or uh, you, you're immobile um, or not as mobile because of, of your age or, or, or disability, all these things that the digital technology has helped elucidate and, and, and remove some of those barriers to that. But also money has been a big thing that it's actually said, um, and by that too, it's removed some of the risk this idea of if I don't have to spend, if I don't have to travel a long way, if I don't have to, in fact, get a carer to help me do it, if I can do it whenever I want, and I can uh, kind of, um, it's not gonna cost me a lot to do, I'm gonna take more risk. I'm gonna do things that maybe are different. And that's what's been really fantastic during this period of time, that we've all had a, um, in our heads, a hardware you know, upgrade, to understand how we can remove some of those layers of, uh, of barriers to people and those kind of big things about that it might be too risky because of all of the investment you need of time and energy and, and get the babysitter or find the parking or what's the, what's the right restaurant to go to. That's been just stepped aside for a second and we go, oh, I might go watch that opera now. Oh, I wonder, what it's got, wonder what's on. Oh, I like that. Oh, I didn't realise I was going to like that. Oh, that's interesting. And now I might take a, a chance on something. Um, a, a lot of Indigenous arts have been a bit like that too, where people have gone, apparently um, online Bangara uh, has just gone through the roof because people are going, oh, I might sit and watch that. I'll take a bit of a risk. I didn't realise. And then suddenly they go, oh, yeah, that was good. Now I might go to a live experience. Um, it was interesting, the Metropolitan Opera, this is now a few years old, but they were talking when they did that, um, Metropolitan Opera Live, that they saw their audiences increase by almost 20% into the live experience because they were doing, and they said it because they were doing these um, broadcast experiences. And I think we can see that happening for us as well. People will be more willing to come to a live experience because they've removed some of the barriers, tested out what they like or don't like, and now they're prepared to take a much bigger risk financially or investment of time, et cetera. Yeah, and, and what you observed and, and navigate over the year. Yeah. But I think that we should we should hold on to the live. I mean, you know, theatre has been dying for about 2,000 years is what I've heard. You know, <laughs> oh, theatre's dying, theatre's dying. Yeah, well, it's been dying a very long time. And the, the issue I have, with, especially with theatre, is that what's the difference between theatre on screen and film. They're two very different art forms um, that are related, obviously, but making sure that we know where we're going with both, that theatre on screen is a different art form to film and audiences need to build that a vocabulary of understanding of what's going on. Yeah, because otherwise you're just, you're just playing at making bad TV or bad, bad movies. Art, art films. You're making okay. art films. You're making dogma films. Yes. Yeah, that's, yeah. <laughs> A little chalk outline for the set, yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, thanks so much, Wesley. It's been a pleasure to chat and uh, 
to keep talking over the years. We at Australian Plays really value these conversations and value our partnership with Sydney Festival. And being able to celebrate the work of Australian writers is so important and so um, so vital. Thank you. Really Thanks, John. And also, I know Australian Plays is going through a lot of changes at the moment. And what we have to make sure we do is keep celebrating the role of the writer in, in imagining our future and giving us the words for what we need when we're going through crises or change. That writers have always been the ones who help shape our kind of amorphous thoughts into shaped ideas to take us forward. So keep up the good work, even through this change at Australian Plays. Thank you. Thanks very much, Wesley.